I would like if anyone, please, you can post your questions, uh, but I can start ahead with a couple of uh, questions for Dr. Nadine and Dr. Roy. I think if we have uh, an advantage from the current uh, COVID uh, pandemic is it may just realize how to reshape uh, how we deliver our cancer uh, practice and reshape uh, the delivery of service uh, in the future. Uh, hence, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, number one is, um, I think this is just the beginning, the way we are uh, delivering it. I think the optimum, uh, what we need is uh, the futures and the quality and the outcome using those uh, platforms uh, for cancer care. Uh, what I meant is the quality of surgeries done or the services and the screening and how will it impact financially as well as uh, uh, oncologically on the survival. So, interview Dr. Nadine or Dr. Roy. Um, Nadine, would you like to go first or I can, I'm happy to go first. So, so thank you, Professor Samar. I think I think um, I, I alluded to the pandemic, and 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 so have the other speakers uh, in various ways. One of the interesting things that we uh, at Watson Health are doing, uh, and and indeed the WHO has been doing as well, is looking at risk stratification. So, if you imagine when the pandemic hit, a lot of the elective um, uh, cancer treatments and services were put on hold, and and it needed that amount of um, uh, technology to factor in these aspects so that when cancer services returned, you had to identify the, the cancer patients who were most at risk, whether it was um, primary, metastatic, um, making sure that the services are available. So these risk stratification scenarios were created using artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning. And I think going forward, that is something that we can help with improving the pathways of care. Um, we've seen some of the work that's happened around COVID-19 with the vaccine, with the Oxford vaccine. We've seen the work that's happened around test and trace. So a lot of these have um, um, uh, valuable inputs from the point of view of technology, but specifically um, natural language processing, artificial intelligence and deep learning, if you will. Uh, if not, I will ask Dr. Roy another question. Uh, is the inequalities uh, in uh, providing cancer uh, care for uh, middle and uh, low income classes? I think uh, COVID did, did highlight on this. Uh, so what do you think, uh, uh, you know, the role of artificial intelligence uh, in helping such uh, uh, underprivileged uh, group of uh, cancer patients? That's, um, thank you, Professor Samar. That's such a valid question, right? Especially in the, in the last few months since the pandemic hit. And I think we've seen um, for uh, reasons that are to do with individual patient factors, but also as you rightly pointed out, the, the access to care. Um, we've seen that across the world. Uh, and I think where, um, um, new technologies such as artificial intelligence help, is help to streamline the, the pathway, make the process more efficient. Um, so we were involved with a, a, a project in Africa. Interestingly, I just got back from Addis Ababa before the pandemic hit. We were looking at um, helping the oncologists in Ethiopia, um, not just um, triage and select patients, but also improve their care by identifying these patients as well. So I think in all those respects, um, whether it's screening, timely detection, making sure that they get to be, uh, get to commence their treatment, arrive at a treatment decision prior to that, all these will somehow be, um, it will help by using smarter pathways, including technologies like artificial intelligence. Um, I think it's a gold standard we should aspire to. I agree that we are still not quite there uh, particularly when you talk about um, uh, low or middle income countries. Um, interestingly, I was involved with a, a, a think tank that was based out of Washington DC that was looking at educating um, um, healthcare assistants and nurses with around the COVID pandemic um, about disseminating facts, about training them. So in all these aspects, I think um, technology can help whether it's telemedicine or otherwise. 
but but I agree. I think the the, um, the inequality of care or the distribution of uh, of care um, in various regions have suffered, and if anything, the, the pandemic has highlighted it. But I think we should use this as an opportunity to try and improve on it with new technologies as well. I will, uh, there is another question for you, Dr. Roy, and then I'll uh, also uh, give a chance to Dr. Nazih if he wants to ask any questions. What is the future of IBM Watson Oncology? Um, so I wouldn't necessarily like to comment on specifically about um, some of the, the, the aspects that are still evolving within IBM. But I'd like to say that future direction, maybe. Sure, sure. So, so what uh, I talked about um, uh, clinical decision support. Um, uh, the, the large focus is of IBM. The work that we're doing is uh, relying on cloud to better scale and 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 provide treatment um, or support for treatment and healthcare systems with smarter pathways, with uh, with improving the outcome of clinical trials. So I think we are kind of, um, I, I wouldn't like to say we're kind of there yet or even the middle of the journey, but the next few years are certainly going to be very exciting. I, uh, you heard the previous speaker talking about the role of um, artificial intelligence radiology. So there's going to be, uh, there is some exciting work that's happening around um, um, uh, radiology and imaging. Um, so so I, I, like I said, uh, without unfortunately divulging too much, I think there's some of the exciting work we hope will be eventually come to scale. And um, I think we should watch this space, not just necessarily within IBM, but with any of the other companies that are working in the field of uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare. Dr. Nadine, you are back with us. Uh, you heard our first question. Yes, yeah, so um, if you wouldn't mind repeating the question, my connection. We, uh, we, uh, 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 I was saying this is just perhaps the beginning uh, of using artificial intelligence or augmented reality in surgery. I think what we, uh, the ultimate, what we need to, to know in the futures, and maybe we need to prepare for it from now, is to know the uh, effect on the quality and the oncological outcome, as well as the cost. You know, uh, if, if you have uh, more people doing more quality surgeries, uh, this will definitely affect on prognosis as well as the cost. Uh, are we, you know, did we still uh, start embarking on this or, or not? Absolutely. I mean, it's a really important question. I mean, one of the fundamental things of what we were trying to do with Proxime was amplify expertise beyond the four walls of a single hospital. Traditionally, we've seen models of care where it gets centralized into big teaching hospitals or big centers of care which is excellent because you wanna make sure that these centers have a real expertise in the quality of care that they're delivering. Sometimes that challenge can have, of course, is bottlenecking of the system where everyone is waiting to travel into this big central teaching hospital. But what we started to work with hospitals is create a hub and spoke model where that central hospital is able to amplify its expertise to peripheral centers that have an element of quality control from the central bit. So for example, health systems around the US or around Europe where a central hospital is responsible for the care, such as colorectal cancer resection, but they're supporting and amplifying work to the peripheries. If you think about Saudi Arabia, for example, you can think about a certain teaching hospital or a big hospital, a center of excellence within Riyadh, supporting hospitals across all the peripheral centers. This amplifies care to more places. It upskills centers peripherally, but it maintains because of the digital footprint, because of the continuation of that element of, of recording or having it within a secure library for the organization, you can maintain quality control and review video performance metrics. This is really necessary because we see it at least in the UK and I'm sure this is the same in other places, you know, patients can wait and there's bottlenecking happening where we're trying to deliver care to so many patients and they're not getting it because they're, they're centralizing all under you know, one, one center or four walls. We have to think about skilling more doctors. There is an increasing deficit between the number of doctors that can deliver these complex cases and the number of patients that need the care. And unless we try to think about force multiplying or amplifying that expertise by using these technologies, we're going to continue to struggle and we're going to reach a point where that deficit is so big that we won't be able to treat every patient that we need to treat. Of course, more upstream, it's about screening and detection early on. It's not just about the surgical care. And that's why we've been bringing in artificial intelligence but also collaboration within screening, because again, we do see missed polyps, missed screening, incomplete um, colonoscopies and endoscopies and those kinds of situations. 
And if we're able to leverage a network of colonoscopy or endoscopy suites, for example, for colon cancer, can we start to, to amplify that? And we have ethics approval and we're building health economics models behind this. My ask really from the group here is to really think big and think about how these solutions can deliver. We've already shown using this technology, we can upskill, we can reduce variation, we can ex increase access to quality surgery when it's needed. And we've done this across Wales, we've done this across the UK, and we're doing this across the US as well. And I would really like this as, as a person from the region personally, that this is something we scale across the Gulf region as well, because we do have fantastic surgeons and fantastic hospitals. We just need to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. And just before I give the uh, mic to Dr. Mazi, there was an earlier question, uh, which we even discussed, if you remember. What about uh, the medical legal implications of the, ser the expert surgeons who provide the uh, advice? Absolutely. So one of the key things for me when setting up Proxy, because I'm a surgeon as well, is that I wanted to make sure all those sort of deal breakers, those things that concern surgeons and as they would concern me, were addressed very early on. So we put very good governance in place around HIPAA, GDPR. For the Gulf regions, we host locally on the local um, data center so that it is the data staying within countries so to give that extra level of protection. The second thing was the medical legal component. What Proximy is doing today is just digitizing what we've done for many, many years. Many times, I'm sure you all remember calling up a colleague surgeon or asking a surgeon to come into your operating room to give an opinion. What would you do here? I've got this really difficult case. What do you think you should do? What, what should I do? That opinion, that sharing and communication used to be done in a more analog way. What we're doing today is we're digitizing that. So the medical legal implications very much remain as they've always been. And we have this very clearly chartered within our end user license agreements and all the data protection agreements that we have with hospitals. That ultimately the patient on the table is the responsibility of the surgeon whose hands are on the patient. And all the other tools are communication and support for decision making, but ultimately it's your decision. That has been very well received by the healthcare community. It's why we are in 20 to 30% of NHS hospitals. We're in over 70 hospitals in the United States. We're in about 15 hospitals in the Gulf and also another 10 to 15 in Asia PAC. We're gonna be in about 300 hospitals by the end of this year. So it's being accepted at pace. We have endorsement by the Royal College of Surgeons, SAGES, ESCP, ACB, GBI. So we're comfortable from that point of view and we've set that framework or what one could call the terms of engagement. So I hope that gives comfort to those who may be thinking about using these solutions. Dr. Nadine, would you like to continue with some of the questions? Yes, have please, any questions? Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for uh, their uh, great presentations. Um, uh, I'm coming from a biomedical engineering background. I'm not a radiologist. Uh, so I would like to ask a few questions about the nature of uh, multidisciplinary work uh, that was shown by Dr. Mitrib al kabir who has very interesting background. He's uh, a medical doctor, he's a radiologist, but he started learning how to program. And he started doing artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, techniques to help him in, uh, in his own daily work. What do you think from what you're seeing now in the area, would you see a change in the education curriculums uh, in radiology departments across the globe? Do you see this trend coming in where uh, radiologists are required to learn about artificial intelligence, about big data, about machine learning, about programming at least? Uh, do you think this is coming or uh, uh, radiologists will still have to rely on computer scientists to learn these techniques? Uh, my question is to both uh, speakers, Dr. Roy and Dr. Nadine. I'm happy to jump in a little bit if that's helpful, but I'll wait for Dr. Roy. Oh, no, please, Nadine, please go ahead. I mean, just on the essence of uh, biomedical engineering, I mean, I share your comment. Uh, I, too, am not an engineer, but I really believe largely in the element of the multidisciplinary across not just healthcare, but across the, the sector. So one of the roles that I also play is I'm the head of innovation for Guys and St. Thomas's. So on the same hospital site, we have engineers working together with scientists, with clinicians, nurses, porters. And when we think about innovation solutions, and I'm, I'm going to take your question and slightly uh, answer it, I guess, from my point of view, you know, we really believe that these solutions, um, the solutions of innovation in healthcare have to be multidisciplinary across multiple sectors coming together. We need to understand health economics. We need to understand business, engineering, healthcare, 
patient pathway, having patient advocates within that journey. So very much that I think when we start to think about leveraging innovation hubs or healthcare hubs within our centers, we have to be bringing a lot of those solutions together. Our hospital has one of the biggest AI centers in the country, and we're doing quite a lot of work there and also partnering with a lot of sector partners um, around federated uh, learning sets, data learning sets. So from that point of view, it's very interesting. But I would also say when we think about surgery, at least from my personal experience, oftentimes we think about surgery surgeon, the surgeon in the operating room. But what we really need to think about is how these solutions are not just supporting the surgeon, but the surgical team and think about teams. So how are we actually upskilling and supporting scrub nurses, anesthetic teams, other members of the surgical, the wider surgical team in delivering care to patients? And then how do we start to leverage data to think about feeding information back into the system? Are we efficient? What's our time to do operations? What's our performance? What's our outcomes? Uh, what in instruments are we using? How often are we using these instruments, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we move an operating room that is traditionally so analog or an operating experience, because it's the whole patient journey, to something that's much more digital, much more data-driven, and much more accountable to that as well. And that really requires the intersection of healthcare, academic, engineering, business to come together. So that's been my passion and something I've been working on for the last few years. I hope that answers your question. And just to add, well, probably not to add a lot, I think Dr. Nadine has answered everything um, uh, that was asked really. Um, and I suppose, if you will, what she's described as surgeon uh, is rightly something that's transferable into any specialty, right? I think that's that's important sort of takeaway. And, and also remember that we are, it's not necessarily to serve clinicians, but as she rightly pointed out, any member of a clinical team, it could be an MDT coordinator, and I'd just like to just spend a minute talking about what we did at Guys and St. Thomas's. Uh, Nadine, will, these are colleagues of hers, uh, Dr. Madge, um, um, Hartman Crystallite, who's one of the breast oncologists. So we were looking at something that could improve the MDT performance. Uh, again, it was using um, uh, oncology concordance tool. Um, but the point I'm making is that if it can save time, you know, uh, I'm sure Nadine, you'll agree with me. We as clinicians spend two, three hours in an MDT. And a lot of the time, uh, you know, these are, uh, I, I hate to use the word tick box exercises, but sometimes you have a, a standard plan. If there's anything that can speed up that process, make sure that the MDT performer is, is filled up. And, and we found very interestingly that the concordance between, um, between the clinical decision support tool and the MDT practitioners, whether it was the breast surgeons, the radiologists, the oncologists, was more than 90%. And that's going to be presented hopefully um, next year at ASCO. Um, but again, underlying all the technology, it's anything that can speed up, make efficient, and ultimately improve patient outcomes. Uh, I have a very interesting question, to be honest, uh, taking it to another level. How can artificial intelligence help accelerate the process of clinical trials that usually time consuming and can, can last for several years. Can artificial intelligence help perform or simulate some of the clinical trials and speed up the process for both speakers? Um, if, I, if I may go first. So, so one of the things that, um, uh, that we've done for the last few years at IBM Watson Health was looking at clinical trials matching. Um, um, and we have this very interesting um, uh, partnership with some of the healthcare providers and hospitals around the world, including the US and Europe, and indeed in, 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 in England as well, that was looking at um, identifying patients, screening them, um, making sure that the, the research coordinator or the clinician could identify which potential trials locally or commercially that the patient would be eligible for. And ultimately, once the patient is enrolled within the, within the solution, then um, uh, help to flag up any, anything that could include or exclude them from, from the trial or flag up any abnormal results and ultimately sort of help the whole process get along quickly. And, and, and uh, the research nurses could see the value in something like that, which would mean that they would be able to spend more time with their patients. You know, a lot of the repetitive tasks that they ultimately spend time with. And I remember as, as one of the PI, as, as a PI in many trials, that we would have to screen patients the day before clinic. Is, this, is patient X and Y eligible for this trial? And pouring through notes, going through EPR. So anything that can automate and speed up the process uh, would certainly help. 
Another um, uh, interesting uh, innovation that IBM is in part of is called DigiTrials, and that is particularly relevant in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So DigiTrials was a consortium that involved IBM, Microsoft, and the Oxford group that Sarah Gilbert is part of, as well as AstraZeneca, and helped to sort of speed up the process. Uh, the recovery trial was also part of that. And you know that obviously that was um, in some ways um, practice changing. But the point I'm making is that it sped up the process. So um, the, a lot of the, uh, the, the work could be done in the background by non-humans and would help the clinicians and the trial coordinators do their work much more efficiently. I would, I would echo everything that you're saying. I would add that we are starting to see a real trend shift into AI for clinical trials. It's so essential to think about not only just the digitization of the trial methodology, but also thinking about newer types of, you know, more adaptive clinical trials as opposed to the traditional, you know, RCTs and, uh, you know, it's one limb or another, and that's the only way we can do a trial. From our point of view, we're also seeing a lot of SMEs that are coming out, partnering with Watson and other companies to try and really think about that. And on the flip side, we need to think about how as health systems or hospitals, we start to build up centers for digital therapeutics. How do we start to evaluate these digital solutions, these digital methodologies for scale or for use? So that's some work that we're doing within our hospital that I'll, I'll be leading on in terms of how do we have um, institutes that can evaluate further these digital solutions that are completely in agreement with what Dr. Roy said. We need these to try and really adapt and become more agile and quicker and efficient in how we do these trials um, and be able to scale our teams more effectively. Okay. I'd, just like to add, I'd like, just like to add one more sentence, if I may. Um, so one of the other uh, aspects that um, I think um, technology can help with is with real world evidence. So we know that obviously the gold standard has always been randomized clinical trials, phase three trials, if you will. But a lot of that doesn't necessarily mirror what we see in, in, in the real world, if you will. So having benefit from that kind of data is something that uh, a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, companies, if you will, a lot of clinicians are very interested in working hard on. Yeah, I think on, the, on, the thesis, on that thesis, we're also seeing a lot around synthetic data sets that can mirror real world and give us that real great ex experience. And I know um, Watson and many other groups are working very hard on that, which is really needed. Um, okay, I, I have a question for Dr. Nadine and Dr. Roy based on the statement made from Dr. Mitab, uh, is that uh, when calculators uh, appeared, people said we no longer need accountants. Uh, and in reality, we still need accountants. However, their role has evolved and changed and became the more advanced. Now, uh, in your experience from what you see in the area, and I'm I'm interested uh, in, in, in this question because it will help uh, radiologists currently viewing. Uh, what are the new roles what the radiologists would have to take, an oncologist would have to take, uh, if the AI uh, became more evolving and more advanced and it's doing many things that are, uh, they are currently doing, but the AI is capable of doing it in more faster way, more accurate way, uh, more reliable way. Uh, uh, what, what is the new role for them? This will help, I guess, the viewers to start uh, gaining those uh, uh, skills and uh, the new accountant skills that will appear because of the calculators and the Excel and the Lotus one, two, three. Uh, this whole thing caused an evolution in the accountant. What is the upcoming evolution in oncology and radiology due to uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence from your experience? You want to go first, Dr. Roy, then I'll share my views as well. Sure. Look, I, I think uh, to all the clinicians uh, who were attending, uh, I think we've all been through a very rigorous process. And I think we, 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 we bring that experience uh, for our patients, right? So I don't think that's replaceable in any way. I think where technology comes in, and, and uh, Dr. Nazi, you asked about, um, about radiology. So if you imagine a solution that might help to detect uh, these indeterminate lesions, that will really help the radiologist. I don't think it will replace him or her. And I think we have to see it in that context. Um, certainly there are, as I alluded to, there are repetitive tasks that, um, that we can do without, um, and that will certainly save us a lot of time. But all that will mean, I think, is that it will improve our practice. 
I don't think we are going to become redundant in any way. Uh, I think we are only going to become more efficient. Uh, technology is going to help. Um, and going forward, yes, there are certain things that we will do less of. Um, but as we've seen with any, um, with any uh, career or any, any um, job, if you will, um, it, it, it evolves in a, in, a, in a positive way. And especially uh, in, in, in something like radiology, surgery, or, 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 um, or oncology for that matter. Uh, I don't think uh, these years and years of training is in any way substitutable by anything that's out there uh, in terms of new technology. I would echo that view. I would say it's why we use the words AI assisted or robotic assisted or whatever assisted uh, assessment, procedure, care. I would agree that you know these solutions are not here to replace us. They're actually there to amplify our, you know, and, and make ourselves more efficient. If you think about our, you know, a radiologist in my hospital, they have to look at thousands of scans. Probably, you know, say 60, 70% of these are normal chest x-rays that they have to do as part of the procedure. If you can take away that that load, that kind of low hanging, low, you know, high burden, but low hanging fruit kind of caseload off them, it actually frees up their time to focus more, for example, on the scans that have pathology or to be able to review those, discuss it within an MDT, discuss it within their teams, look, look at patients and how we can enhance the patient journey. The, we always get this asked the same question in surgery, is this going to replace surgeons or surgeons ability? Absolutely not. Ultimately, as a clinician, what you're doing, whether you're a radiologist, a surgeon, a, a, a physician, you're aggregating lots of different information and data sets and it's supporting decision-making for the patient journey. These systems aren't going to replace today empathy, discussion with the patient about their life and the support structure that they have and how they're gonna get through the next 18 months of their cancer treatment or whatever it may be. And so we find that these solutions are only gonna actually free up some of our time from the very mundane things that we sometimes have to do and give us that opportunity to redirect that effort and energy into things that are really needed around the patient journey. So I'm a big advocate for these solutions in the context that they are assisting us and absolutely not replacing us. Uh, Dr. Roy, one question about IBM Watson uh, strategy. I mean, how it works. Uh, currently, there are keywords uh, that are entered through the clinical file of a patient through the AMR, the diagnosis, the test results, and uh, uh, the symptoms, and all these things that are in the patient file. And the Watson, as I understand, searches the medical database on everything related using uh, these keywords and comes back with previous recommendations and previous steps to recommend a certain uh, treatment strategy. Is that an accurate way of putting it? Um, so, the, so the clinical decision support system that you're alluding to, yes. I mean, I, I, I certainly, uh, what I can say is that the oncology strategy is evolving. Um, but but yes, to your to your description, I think that would be a fair assessment. So um, uh, going for yes, uh, please. So if that's the case, then uh, I mean the publications. I mean there are thousands and thousands of publications out there, and some of them are incredible journals and in strong journals that have strong peer reviews, while others are like in uh, in a newspaper. Uh, let me say it's a journal, a scientific journal, but it's just like working like a newspaper. You pay subscription and you get your uh, article published without any significant peer review. So how does IBM Watson distinguish between a real peer reviewed journal and a journal that just publishes, uh, maybe, uh, I, I'm not saying publishes something with money, maybe the peer review is not as intensive as other uh, strong journals. How do you distinguish in, in Watson between this and that? Sure. So, so historically, um, the the solution was trained by Memorial Sloan Kettering, who were the training partner, and 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 that has been the, the if you will, the 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 way in which these um, publications are identified. But irrespective of that, using natural language processing, what Watson was able to do, has been able to do, was to identify articles that are relevant to the um, to that particular case, if you will. Now, I think it's important to remember that this is something that is evolving. Uh, like I said earlier on, I don't think we're kind of uh, at that sort of gold standard yet. And that is what um, that is what a lot of the work that not just IBM, but many other companies and uh, academia and research um, organizations are trying to do, is to try and improve that. Now, 
I think we have to kind of take pause there and, and recognize that, um, again, as clinicians, you know, if you ask uh, anybody here about a particular practice changing article, he or she will be able to know that quite well, having been trained in that. I think where it helps is to be able to um, provide, if you will, something that can be printed out for the patient or something that's useful for trainees, etc. So we're not there yet. Um, and I'd like to think that there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. But basically, okay. humans would need to teach Watson but, how to distinguish just between... Because, uh, my apologies, because we really passed the time. Okay, all right. I think this will continue uh, with apologies. I think uh, it's a very interesting session. We can, you know, discuss the full day. Uh, but I think we have a, a long day to continue and we don't want to delay. Uh, I'm sure we'll, there is a lot of, uh, the whole aim of this session, honestly, to highlight, and it's about time in our uh, uh, region that we start uh, using uh, such uh, technologies. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, there is a collaboration now with uh, Dr. Nadine and hopefully with Dr. Roy. Uh, so uh, uh, at that, I would like to um, thank all the speakers for such an excellent uh, session as well, in fact, and for all uh, participants for the uh, discussions, which uh, I think it was very fruitful and it just is the start. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And we'll take a five minutes uh, break before the next session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.